What's up, squadron? Aviation has given me a ton of amazing experiences. And more importantly, it's introduced me to a whole new family of friends. Join us tonight because we're clear direct for some hangar flying. I'm Ryan Dombrowski, and this is Super Arrow Live. What is up, Super Aero Squadron, Sky Fam, Av Geek nerds? How are you tonight? It's Wednesday. Can only mean one thing. It's time for another episode of Super Aero Live. And uh, you guys are super active in the chat already. It's so awesome to see all of you. I'm going to try to get through this intro as quick as possible because, guys, I turned that hard maybe into a hard yes. Uh, <laughs> first of all, do me a favor. Hit the like button. Make sure you subscribe. Like 60% of you that watch the show aren't subscribed, which just breaks my heart. Uh, and then share the episode, all that jazz. I want to give a big thanks to last week's guest, me, for rocking that thing out. And a big thanks to all of you guys in the chat for hanging out and asking awesome questions. We actually got a whole hour in of just goofing off about airplanes in the chat, which was... My heart grew three sizes. I was the aviation Grinch at the beginning, and you guys warmed my heart. It was great. And then uh, next week, be sure to tune in. Uh, it sounds like Just Plain Silly is going to be on again. And that's going to be probably dumb, but we'll see. We'll see. All right. My first and only guest tonight needs no real introduction, but let's throw him up on the screen anyway. I don't know. That wasn't that great. Hey, guys, it's Flight Chops. How's it going? <laughs> It's going, man. How are you doing? Hanging in there, trying to. I mean, I'm lucky. I'm in a. I'm in a unique spot because I have so much footage of things I have stacked up. So I've got a thing behind me here that was literally shot in July of 2018. So that's how far back my footage catalog goes. That's that's some Alaska stuff. So that's I have awesome. lots of content. That I'm not. I'm not hurting in that regard. So I'm feeling lucky. But production has been pretty much ground to a halt. So you have a, a lot of stuff in the can because you do a lot. And I have a lot of stuff in the can because I don't ever edit it. The first ever unaired episode of Super Arrow was shot over five years ago. And I think I might finally edit it. <laughs> wow, Thanks, okay, so COVID. You got, you got me beat there. Thanks, COVID. It's just been sitting there. I'm going to like, it's going to look like I'm a baby. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. when, I, when I started up. Anyway, a lot of people saying hi to you in the chat, and I just want to shout out to a couple of people. We've got Speed Breaks here, Zach Sherman's here, John Fun Fun and Niche. I can't pronounce words. Uh, Gabriel's here. He's from Canada. He said Canada represent. Uh, Krieger, Wolfacorn, Just Plain Silly, Bob Smith, Dutchy Girls here from, I don't know where she is, somewhere in Europe. Uh, super awesome, guys. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Let's, like, cut right... I just want to cut right in. You sent me a video, like an intro video, and I can't imagine if you're an aviator... Uh, I'm trying not to make your head too big right now, but if you're an aviator uh, and you're into YouTube, you you got to know who you are. But just in case there's, like, one person who doesn't, why don't I roll this intro, and that'll kind of set up the conversation for tonight about what uh, what it is this crazy thing that, that you do. Sure. Worked hard to get here. It's gonna try not to screw it up. <laughs> it started with simple self-analysis videos that I shared with some friends, and the reaction was great. And Flight Chops was born. Creating content for Flight Chops has taken me places I'd never imagined. It is a beautiful night for flying. Allowing me to fly dozens of types of aircraft. Is this a little uncomfortable for you? Not uncomfortable. The good news is I don't really have a comfort zone because I'm doing so much crazy stuff all the time. Meet some amazing people and achieve some incredible things along the way. Congratulations, Steve Chops. You passed your rescue swimmer survival qualification today. My end goal has always been to get checked out in a Spitfire. And with each new aircraft I log time in, it feels like it's getting closer and closer to becoming a reality. Contact! Some of the adventures I've been a part of have taken me far from the flight line, while always keeping aviation at the core. Why am I doing this? So that's a good cut right there. 
giving me the opportunity to share my love of flying with my family. <laughs> that was so fun. All in all, it's a dream come true. You guys are like connected, it's crazy. It's entirely thanks to the flying community, and I'm happy to share every step of it. You have got it completely. You are a helicopter pilot. Well, you've gone and done it. Now you got to get this airplane back on the ground by yourself. So dope. I have like a yeah. million questions based on just watching that intro. So do I. <laughs> <laughs> so okay so before we dig into like flight chops the you call it the flight chops experiment a lot um before we dig into that i'm wondering if you could just take us back to like that like i always ask people on this show like what's your origin story like what's your yeah. aviation origin story like how do you get how'd you get started uh so i always wanted to fly always knew i wanted to fly you know ever since i was a little kid didn't really have a family member. I mean, my grandfather flew Spitfires in World War II, so I had those kind of stories from my dad, but I didn't really get to know my grandfather. He had Alzheimer's when I was, I guess, 10 or so, and then really I never really got to know him and hear any of his direct stories. But other than that, there was no family member, no uncle, no friend of the family that could take me flying. So really it was up to me to figure it out. And I tried joining Air Cadets. That didn't really work out as a 12-year-old so is it air cadets mm -hmm. is a, a for the u.s people is that like oh. a military thing or is it yeah i i guess that's not a thing in the states eh? so yeah you just kind of there's sea cadets air cadets and army cadets here so you stream into one of those things it's pretty cool it's it's a great way to get early access to understand how that particular stream of the military works or whatever with air cadets a small percentage of them do get the training i think all of them have access to gliding in the summer program a certain when they're 15 or whatever i didn't even make it that wasn't in there because that's long enough to even do that and then i think like literally three percent of the top best officers or whatever get their privates sponsored when they're like 18 or something um but for me i just it wasn't my parents weren't supportive enough to take me every time and then as soon as you miss a couple like you're out of the running to be in the top three percent so i pretty much lost interest when i realized i wasn't going to get the chance for the flight training because that's really all i was there for honestly props and hats off to everybody in the military it's just not my thing i wasn't into that side of it um did the math and realized i could save the money at a part-time job in about the same amount of hours so i got a job early on in like when i was 15 problem was I was 15 so that money went to a car yeah <laughs> so 1985 Volkswagen Scirocco that's what my pilot license money went to when I was 16 and uh anyway when I was 21 between first and second year university I got my act together and did did it so I got my license I, I started off with soaring so I got solo that summer and then as and soon you sent as me some hit, photos of that while we talk about it. Yeah, so that's my first solo in a Schweitzer 233. There it is. <clears throat> I had my mom there taking stills. I think the date is somewhere on those pictures. It's probably 95. Um, so, yeah, that's By the way, your mom's a fantastic photographer. Like, she she did really, a good job. She she's a really good. She got, like, the touchdown. She got the rollout. <laughs> Here you are. Yeah, so that's how I started. There I am in the, my long hair and a ponytail. And, this, one's uh, got the, this next one's got the date. No, is it yeah so it's 95 i think i can't see it on my screen but it's a 10 it. 10 9 so that would be september yeah so that's about right at the end of the summer i soloed in the gliders and then moved on to power that winter and had my power my private in did my flight test in a cessna 150 in 1996 the winter so that was how i started and then quickly realized I had kind of a what now moment when I was broke as a student in university who just got his license and spent every drop of money I had to do it. And I also really put myself under a great deal of pressure to do it in minimums. Here, I think it's the same in the States. It's 45 hours is the requirement to get the private. I think it's 40. I flew my flight test. Okay, so here it's 45. So I flew my flight test on hour 39. So after the flight test was over, I think I had like... 41.2 or something so i couldn't even take my first passenger until i had 45 logs <laughs> so i did it in minimums but that's not to say i'm a genius it's just that i was really good at fooling my instructor on a regular basis to always 
you know, signed me off for the next step. And I actually had very little actual confidence. <laughs> so I was faking it till I make it, essentially. And I don't recommend putting yourself under that kind of pressure because I didn't enjoy it. I was constantly stressed out during my training, fighting to do it in minimums. And I had a what if moment or a what now moment after I had the license. And I remember sitting at the diner that I always drove home after my training with my temporary license on the table and the burger I just ordered and I just could not eat it. I was just so coming down from the adrenaline high of that day. It was such a rough day because I booked it for the morning. It was too windy, but the examiner was cool. And he said, no, we can hang around. It's cool. I've got things to do. And I was like, great. I haven't eaten anything. I'm not going to be able to eat because I can't eat when I'm stressed out like this. So I had like a bowl of soup or something and did my flight test hours later and got through it like a hypoglycemic attack and made it. But that was an epiphany for me to realize like I should have enjoyed that journey. <clears throat> so mm. years went by and I maintained my currency minimally, you know, as a broke college student where I was flying, the requirement was to log 30, like a 0.5 every 30 days. So 30 minutes and 30 days. So I did exactly that the whole lunch of like, I got a lot of 0.5s and 0.6s in my logbook from those, that, those years. So like literally a few years went by where I would log like, six hours or whatever in a year sure and it, you know during i'm, I'm there right now man i get it i get it <clears throat> so you know doing the city tour flying around toronto in a 172 kind of repeat and rinse and do that flight again and again found myself wondering like i got this thing this lifelong dream and i don't know uh, what to do with it really and then i lost currency during the whole you know wife kid house whole thing happened between like 2005 and 2009 so i wasn't current in that period and I almost it almost went away like i almost let it go that was almost five years and it was really gopros and ipads both happened in that period of time so that kind of really changed the whole world i remember when i was getting back to being recurrent i had a gopro and looking at my footage and realizing things i could fix and debriefing and sharing with friends and at the same time my wife got me the ipad that year for christmas so i could get four flight Specifically because she knew how much I hated the paper charts. Which I always did. That was what I hated the most. Soaring I loved. It was just looking out the window. I didn't even have the technology that beeps at you like the new gliders have now. Oh, sure. You just, you just listened to the sound. You knew how fast you were going based on the wind. I mean, so as soon as I got into the 150, I remember distinctively thinking, all this stuff is like in the way. This panel mm -hmm. is vibrating and shaking and it's all this noise, this visual noise and stuff. And then I have to deal with this paper chart that's like just hieroglyphics and never can never find myself on the chart. And I'm always like, I used to try to keep my finger on the chart and, and like making marks as I went by things and doing all these things you did back in those days. I'm glad I did it and I know how to do it, but oh my God, do you reference digital maps now? Like, come on. So those tools changed the way I felt about the things I didn't like about the flying and then having the GoPros to debrief really opened up the world of quickly being able to relive a flight, review it, debrief it, and get the value out of it because it always felt like, man, that was so expensive and it's mostly gone because it was all adrenaline while you're doing it and it's hard to remember everything. And sure, I did, sure. I did have an SOP that a good instructor gave me early on, which was don't just write down one sentence in your logbook after each flight actually make a, a note that's longer like a paragraph or, or longer to, to say what worked what didn't what, what were the conditions specifically make note of what the winds were what you know anything that you felt you could do better or whatever and that's all well and good but you can only make a note of what you can remember one of the early kind of again epiphany moments was just a fun flight that i recorded i remember thinking the, the controller was kind of sort of annoyed at me for some reason and i don't know why and then looking back at the footage, it was because he had tried to call me three times, but my passenger was talking and I didn't hear it. So I truly did not know he had tried to call me three times until I looked at the footage. So that really made me realize like debriefing with video and recording the intercom truly gives you an actual record. So you can, if you, if you want to put the time and effort in, you can debrief your whole flight in real time and really get double the value or triple the value out of it. So that really helped me out getting recurrent around 2010, 2011. And then, dude, you know, YouTube was happening and I was watching flying stuff there and that was amazing because before that there was almost no flying content anywhere that you could see. Like I, I drank up everything I could on TV that was available in those early days and it was never that great. 
Yeah, um, I, I agree. That would, That's one of my big struggles when I started flying was that there was nothing I could actually, like, enjoy. Like, I, re- I remember watching, like, the Wings on... Th- it was in the U.S. It was the Discovery Channel Wings. It was, like, this, like, monitor. Like, the the P-51 was yeah, weighed 5,200 yeah. million pounds. And I was like, that's all I get? That's yep. all I get is yep. this? And I, I drank it up. <laughs> Me too, but I it was like... all those shows, whatever I could get, and I, it was always, like, the tiniest bit of detail, and I was always frustrated that they didn't actually show me what I wanted to see because it was made for a mainstream audience. Mm-hmm. So really it was, and I was working in TV at the time, trying so hard to get involved in flying content, and any time I got close to something that seemed like it was going to be good, it ultimately devolved into reality TV. And that's a whole other story that's not really worth wasting time on, but, I mean, the short version is I got into film school I got out of film school into the industry in 1998, was loving it, and then 2000, uh, a writer's strike and an actor strike happened at the same time, and a producer we all know and love named Mark Burnett came up with something that he could do without writers or actors, which was Survivor. If you all remember the first Survivor, that was essentially the birth of mainstream reality TV, and it completely destroyed (laughs) the art to me of what the industry (laughs) was. At the same time, digital video was a thing, so footage, which I was actually working with film in film school, and frames and feet of film were really a thing. That was no longer a thing, so you could shoot as much as you wanted, so they threw an army of camera guys at every project, an army of editors just sorted the mess. And that became, cinematography went out the window, and it was just like, just get it, we'll figure it out later, we'll fix it in post, the amount of times I would hear that. So I was frustrated with my work, honestly in the 2000s and going forward it, it changed so quickly right when i got into it so flight shops so really gonna, became a, a break from that i'm going to interject and say you and i should start a new a, a separate mm-hmm. podcast and it'll be ryan and steve complain about the film industry <laughs> yeah. because i also I, I so i think i finished film school two years after you and uh yeah man like literally taping and gluing film together like like I don't know if you guys. I bet half the people watching this don't even know what film actually is. Yeah, like, twenty four frames per second, baby. Yeah, exactly. But, so anyway, that's another. Is, that's a different podcast. But so understanding that makes me a better filmmaker, I think. And mm-hmm. it's the same with flying. Understanding, I'm glad I can read a paper chart. I'm glad I can read analog instruments and all that stuff. But for flight and glass is just better. And I mean. Yeah. Lots of people argue about it. And lots of guys will try to say, oh, no, you got to use analog and you got to know the paper chart. It's like, sure, fine. But do you still use a slide ruler or are you going to use a calculator? Like, when did you just accept it, embrace the technology? We're at a point now where you back up your iPad with another iPad and or a phone, which is what Flight allows. you got three backups. You keep one safe so it's not in the sun. So if the sun cooks your iPad, you still have a backup and you obviously make sure it's packed and ready to go. You're good. You're backed up. You're legal. You're safe. It's just this is the world we're in now. But I'm glad I understand the fundamentals. And and but going forward, it's just it's awesome. Absolutely. Okay. So I want to dig into the chat real quick, and then we're gonna go to the next part of the flight shop's journey. Okay. A couple things. First of all, uh, someone astutely did the math. Uh, your first solo in your glider was 25 years tomorrow. Damn. We wow. should have got you a cake. That is something. That's I didn't even think about that. Oh, appreciate that. That's so awesome. That's pretty and cool. Sad all at once. No, it's that's amazing. Fun. Come on, that's amazing. And then the, here's uh, there's so many awesome questions in the chat, but one that popped up to me. Dave Angus says, "Steve, not sure if you'll see this. I just passed my Group One IFR on Sunday over at CNY three, or Charlie November Yankee three. Your IFR prep videos helped a ton." So congratulations, Dave. That's yeah, super cool. That's huge. Congrats. Yeah. Like, I mean, that was the hardest thing. And I'm not a good student. I took a long time to do it very publicly. Uh, it was it was humiliating in some ways how long it took me to do it and how many starts and stops I had. But I just felt like, screw it. <laughs> At this point, what Flight Chops is, is about putting it out there. I mean, the joke is, like, the brand was based on a joke. I have a weak chin. I grew a beard my whole life. And then I, I shaved the stupidest mustache I could one year for Movember, which is a charity. And my buddies, like, designed my brand around it as a joke. It was a joke. So I got stuck with stuck it. stuck with so, it. So then occasionally people in the comments will be like, why would you do that to yourself when you have a weak chin? And, and it's like, 
Trust me, I know. <laughs> so, <laughs> I so love that, that people are commenting on your chin. Yeah. No, people, no one comments on my chin. That's the yeah, that's the benefit yeah, of being. Chin, you're good. Having a not a weak chin. <laughs> yeah. um, anyway. So the thing became about putting, I just like, whatever. So with the instrument rating, I decided, uh, you know, yeah, there's a lot. Of, and a lot of people did say, dude, like, just suck it up, man. Why you like? It's like I. This is so hard for me. Like all of it mm-hmm. was so hard. Memorizing all that stuff, the math. Like the actual flying wasn't so bad. It's just regs. Trying to get through the written test. Apparently, the Canadian written test is harder than the American one or something. We don't have the tools like Shepard Air that like let you memorize the whole question bank. Like it isn't like that here. So yeah, that was hard. So the fact that people like it was a Dave are are able to be inspired or motivated by watching my struggle that makes it all worth it so i yeah it's super rewarding to have that out there in my pain like literally blood sweat and tears like my wife said (laughs) i've never seen you so defeated as i've seen you during that time like there were times when i just was like i don't know if this is for me i don't know if i'm gonna and this is so humiliating because i put it out there and so many people are seeing this literal failure because I did fail the written test the first time I tried and I was so busy at that time and I was trying to crank it through and then I failed the test and I just literally the book sat in one place and when I got back to it I think there's a shot in one of the vlogs where you I I got the shot of like wiping the dust off I guess it was my uh, CX3 TX2 whatever the calculator wiping the dust off the screen from it sitting there for a whole year I didn't touch it. It sat on my like bedside table in the corner, and I didn't touch it for a whole year. I was so mad at that stuff. But I got back to it, and, and you know, that's whatever. It is what it is. It took me five years <laughs> to do it, basically the entire duration of flight chops almost, because I started the instrument training proper in like 2014, and I got it in 2019, and the channel started in 2013. So, and, and let's talk about that for a second. So, the channel started in 2013. How many episodes are you up to now? A little over 200. That's a lot of footage. Yeah, and I mean, that's that's what's been cool about it, is that it, it kept me honest as far as once I, I started, I stayed on the treadmill, and I never didn't make my once every two weeks publish. And I think part of that, I have to give credit to the, the crowdfunding on Patreon with that community. It's a very small core group. Um, like I think there's 1100 or so that kind of ebb and flow, but it seems to stick around that number. Um, you know, I, I'm a per thing creator, so I don't do the monthly, which they create that they introduce that option. But I was like, no, I'd rather my work be quantifiable. I want to be honest and accountable to deliver. So, you know, I don't get paid unless I deliver on Patreon. So that really helped me not, miss my deadline of at least two per month for i guess it's coming up on seven so it's over seven years and it's crazy that, so that's crazy too that's crazy too i mean i was thinking about uh i've been i've been thinking a lot about as we getting ready for this show i've been thinking a lot about how like my pilot journey kind of slight i mean you've got your <clears throat> license i started in 2012 but like you you started earlier than i did but like our professional careers are kind of parallel. Like you started flight chops. I was starting to goof around with that stuff, but more worried about, you know, the film industry and stuff like you were talking about. So it's just interesting to me to think about how, uh, there's another white guy with a beard in Canada with my resume, uh, tearing it up. It gives me hope. It gives me hope. You give me hope. Mr. Yeah. Chops. Okay, uh, I, cool. <laughs> I got some more questions. These are coming from uh, Instagram. Uh, some folks wanted to ask you some questions here. And, of course, they disappeared when I opened the app. Here you go. Um, first, let's talk about the Chops for a second. Angle of Attack. Uh, I think we both know Chris Palmer. Uh, he says, the Chops, do they produce parasite or induced drag? I bet you've never heard that joke before. <laughs> Uh, a few times, not too many. Uh, you know, the, <laughs> flying enough open cockpit. It's it's funny they get caught in the straps of uh, the leather helmet. That's annoying. Oh, I bet. I bet yeah. that's super annoying. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you talked about this a little bit, but uh, Varen M asks, uh, "What do you think 
made you a better pilot? Debriefing. Tip- like that, I don't have to even waste time to answer that one. <clears throat> Debriefing. So, again, the question, if I do live talks, I often ask how many people here think they're current, and a lot of hands go mm-hmm. up. It's like I ask how much they fly, whatever, a lot, you know, how many hours a month, blah, blah, blah. Then I ask how many of you write down more than one line in your logbook after each flight. Like, sure. it was sunny, took the wife, 1.3, and you hang up the keys. Basically, everybody was like, no one. Like, it's very rare that I have anyone say they do anything more. Do you even make note of what the winds were specifically? Because what's your personal limit on crosswinds? You can say, oh, I'm good in a 20 yeah. crosswind. It's like, yeah? When was the last time you did that? Was it three years ago? Do you even know? If you've got a debrief logbook that you include those notes, then you can look back and be like, boom, I did a 15-knot direct crosswind you know, three months ago, and I scared myself, so I'm not going to go do that today. Right, <laughs> you know and, I mean? and in whatever airplane, right? <laughs> exactly. So that's right. Yeah. The airplane conditions and, you know, just make note of your – so I, I had a, a debrief document. I've, I've kind of changed the format of it over the years because of the nature of how much video footage I've been going through when I'm editing. I make these extensive notes with the edit, so that's kind of my debrief. It's mm-hmm. not as formal mm-hmm. as it used to be. Frankly, I think it was better when it was more formal because I had this very distinct document that was like the location, the airplane, the conditions, the visibility, the weather, the wind, sure. where I was with, what the variables were that might have distracted me, like was it lots of passengers wanting to talk, were they, you know, all these types of things. Because that's another thing, was it a kid, you know, there's all sorts of things that try so hard to make your flying you know compromised on every flight there's something and it's as simple as if you're taking a kid and he's a button pusher and you gotta like watch out for that or right. whatever it is so yeah debrief man that that to me changed everything so from 2009 i was like a different pilot when i had the proper debrief going like before that i was sort of doing it but i got religious about it after that you know, and I think I think the uh, for me the debrief thing. Uh, I actually started doing what you you're talking about because of your videos, because uh, you mentioned it in one of them, and I was like, oh, that's a good like a do like that crosswind example. Like I know I can go to my logbook and be like, you know, when what's the most I've done in the last six months or whatever, because I write that down. I think the other thing is setting like weather minimums. So there's one of my vid- my very first my very first video I think on Super Arrow. Like we actually, it was the first time I'd ever flown down to three miles visibility. It was probably less. I think the controller was doing us a favor because we were like a mile out. But um, didn't didn't make you ask for special. He just told you you've got three miles. Yeah, he's like you got three miles, and I was and like, all right, know, we'll be right there. <laughs> I had the same experience on one of my early videos where I asked for it because I was like, I don't think I have three miles. And I think he could tell I, that, that video was out there. By the way, that one's been somewhat controversial, even though I did have a, a instructor like mentor really look over it to make sure I wasn't sharing a complete reg bust but it was a good lesson of being scared and the controller did exactly that I asked him what is the visibility and he very specifically said I'm showing three miles and he said it in such a way that put it on the tape and you know it probably was close I think it was less but I think he just knew this kid is not going to be smart enough to ask me for special VFR and if I say less than three miles I can't let him in the control zone unless he asks for it he can't offer it to me legally. So that would have put me in a spot where I would have had to turn around or something and I wasn't prepared. Like it was just, I think the controller knew he's going to be fine. I'm going to let him in. I'm not going to make a mask for it. So exactly. And knowing what I know now, I know that's what he did. At the time, I didn't even know. When I was making the video, I didn't fully understand what that guy had done there. So, yeah. Well, and then, and then with that too, I think the cool thing for me, and I, and I think relating to what you're talking about, the cool thing for you, um, especially as you've flown all these different aircraft and things, um, is recording the video helps me remember it, even though I don't go back and watch the video, right? Like the process of like watching it that one time, it's kind of like when you take notes, you don't, how often do you like, I think it's probably different for everybody. For me personally, if I take notes, I almost never read the notes again. It's just because, like, the act of making it, like, the act of, like, recording it and, like, committing it to memory, watching it once. So knowing, for instance, like, in those situations, like, what that looked like so that the next time you're up there, you're like, okay, like, because in the moment, you're like, oh, my, I'm trying to be better about swearing on the show. Uh, (laughs) It's like, like, holy cow, like, this is happening. My adrenaline's pumping. 
I'm like, am I going to go into IMC? Like, what's happening, right? And then you have, you're getting through the situation and, like, your brain is working at, like, 10, 10% capacity, right? And so having those things to go back later really is, I don't know, I'm just preaching to the choir, but that, that really, uh, that, I think that's part of it, right? Is like, I, yep. I think the debrief thing, like, not everyone is going to want to be a YouTuber or an aspiring YouTuber, but. Nor should they. I, I'm, I'm very, <laughs> I'm very uh, adamant about that. A lot of people are like, how can I do what you're doing? And it's like, you got to think real carefully. Do you want to do what I'm yeah. doing? <laughs> because yeah, hundred um, percent. I'm lucky that I have some really good mentors and advisors that I have look at my stuff to help me make sure that a I'm not going to put myself in a spot where because it's easy that you could edit something that was perfectly legal that can look illegal just based on the edit. So there's that. Dude, you like whole... literally said that as my co-pilot on it was like, I really actually think we had three miles, but it looks really bad. <laughs> like, you like yeah. got that? Like, you guys like it's like you texted each other and coordinated that comment. Right. But yeah. So anyway, that and then there's the whole issue of the 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 responsibility that I feel with the um, example that that is being set. Like, I have, I try real hard to be humble and be clear. Like, I'm not being an instructor. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm not telling you how to do it. But I try real hard to add context, and I'm, it, it weighs on me. So like some of the videos that I wondered, is there enough context? I just don't want somebody to ever do something stupid because they got an idea from one of my videos. So there's a lot of weight there. And I mean, I don't know. you got to ask yourself, is it even worth it? <laughs> so there's that. But whether or not you should even do it. Recording your stuff is great. It's just whether or not you publish is... is it's, it's it's a slippery slope. Everyone should buy a GoPro and put it like back <clears throat> Over here. the shoulder, yeah. So you can see That's the right. panel, you can see what you're doing, and and hook your audio into it so you can yeah. debrief it. Uh, not everyone is ready to be called uh, to have have comments about how dumb your face looks because that's what yeah. mine are all about. Well, there's that. There's that. Yeah, the hate. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's not as bad in this community is is in some communities but there's oh, still some sure. people that really feel the need to, to try to ruin your day Let's put no way. one no one like that in the chat right now they're all super awesome uh okay let's but, go okay so real quick just to also yes debriefing may be better but flying a lot of types may be better and i know everyone is not going to have access to as many types as i do but tailwheel find a way to get your tailwheel endorsement that was like um i don't even it's just so much more i mean there's a reason why i guess they literally called the the tricycle gear when cessna invented that they called it landomatic because after flying tailwheel getting back into 172 it's like yeah you can just let go the thing will land <laughs> like you know what i mean it's it's so much different it, so yeah tailwheel really forces you to actually understand everything from adverse yaw to p factor all that stuff actually really matters in a Cessna, eh, you just kind of need to sort of kind of understand all that, but it'll work out, even if you're not really using the rudder. <laughs> so I guarantee that you've just angered the chat, but well, I also, I've also agree with you. I mean, I did my, I did my primary training in a J3, and I remember the flight moving from the, uh, the school I went to, we moved from J3 to uh, Cherokee 140, and the Cherokee 140 felt like way easier to fly, except uh flaps <laughs> like i just like it, the first couple of flights with flaps you're like oh like what's this thing do oh i'm slow oh i'm falling like all of that stuff was weirdly hard because i was like why well, just slip it right yeah but uh but yeah like and then transitioning from like a j3 to uh 172 which i fly now felt easier at the time right it felt e i don't i don't even know if i could go back and it's been a long time since I've flown a J3. I don't know if I could go back and like actually primacy is a real do thing. it, right? Um, and but, that that comes back to when I did jump into the Super Cub the first time. I that was the first time I got into anything again that was left hand throttle, right hand stick, which is what a glider is basically. The spoilers are your left hand acting ex almost exactly like a throttle. When you pull mm. the spoilers out, it does the same thing as when you pull the throttle back. So when I jumped into the Super Cub, there she is, that was 2014, and I had not touched that type of flight configuration since I was in a glider in 1995, and it came right back, and I felt like, oh, this is home, I'm home again. Like that configuration right there, right-hand stick, left-hand throttle. 
and that um, privacy is real. So I'm lucky that I got to start with soaring in a lot of ways because that put me in a place where, I mean, you got to get it right. You only get one chance to land. I'll, I'll expand on a problem that also created in my privacy in a second. Um, but the other one was that it did force you to be good with the rudder and, and slipping and all that stuff because that's all you got in a glider. Like you don't have the engine to go around and, and try again, you know? Sure. But yeah, this, this airplane really was a pivotal thing this is a this particular video was a pivotal one where i sort of was figuring it out and really nailing it down just solo grass strip dusk by myself really kind of yeah that's my 12th hour just kind of figuring it out and just going and trying to get it shorter and shorter and hit my spot and really really becoming one with the plane so that that flight was pivotal and i'm so glad i have the footage of this because i shared it and it's it's a great memory and it's a great debrief and it's also funny to see how much better i am now that, i mean it's separately that that's like just like a super like that's landing at a grass field in a far like with crops on either side of you and a tailwheel yeah. airplane at sunset or sunrise is like literally yeah. it's like pilot dreams right like that's, yeah and i and i come at that from being a previously only having access to 172s and like some Piper Warriors, which were low wing and, and that's fun and different. And that was it. I mean, that's kind of all I thought I had access to up until this airplane opened the door to everything else. This, this was the gateway drug to all the rest because you, you I needed that fundamental tailwheel changed it all. So going forward, it just opened the door and, and really, help me get yeah so that that was huge tailwheel was huge and of course debriefing tailwheel flying and tailwheel training was huge and i really had it figured out at that point in in 2014 so that that takes us i think to kind of the next and maybe like we've kind of talked a lot about like legacy legacy flight shops legacy uh <laughs> but here's a question that came up and sorry guys my the video is like choking on my end so i don't know if i'm going to be able to like do this here let's see if we can turn that off there we go okay i'm back uh here's a question i think we can, we can use to transition so beyond visual range <coughs> asks <laughs> senior chops which is more fun to fly the harvard or the chipmunk and i like the chipmunk emoji there um, yeah so chipmunk. so all of this has been a journey for you right so like yeah, yeah, where yeah. where so are you at now with that um well i mean i guess now i'm a regular t6 pilot which i never would have thought i would say like that's 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 ridiculous right like literally from the moment that i learned what one of those was which was also early on i got access to a place that had them in the early 2000s and i went and did the ground school and it was kind of like I, sh I showed up thinking i didn't have tailwheel at the time and i thought mm. i'll just tech i'll just ch check off the tailwheel box and i'll be able to go fly this warbird it'll be fine and they didn't laugh at me exactly, but they had every right to really because of the the, the kind of naivety that I approached it with. But I essentially left that experience with the idea that I had just done a history lesson about a thing I will never get to do because I will never be qualified, which at that time I, I was silly to even think I was – I approached it backwards, but I didn't know, right? But, yeah, it's a 6,000-pound giant tail dragger monster complex – supercharged radial engine with that you can over boost and blow up and massive hydraulic system to manage and it's just a beast it requires a certain pathway to get to it um, but there's a lot of barriers that are in the way in some places that make it seem impossible and it's not i mean i'm the case for it i mean I, I i truly think i'm the everyman private pilot who's just been lucky to have some unique experiences but i'm not special i'm not super talented and I'm not highly experienced. I've just been lucky to have opportunities to show that it's possible. So to answer the question, the chipmunk was the gateway sort of entry level airplane at the museum that I'm part of. And then if you got qualified on that airplane, then you can go forward into the rest of the fleet. Chipmunk will always, there she is. Yeah. That'll always be a special airplane. Sort of the poor man spitfire is what they call it. It really did feel like i imagine this bit fire would feel like just really harmonious beautiful so much fun to fly it's it's just yeah it's such a fun cute little airplane and it just does what you ask it to do it's really light on the controls just beautiful fun the harvard 
it's it's I don't know how to describe it. It's fun, but it's I mean, yeah, that picture of the Harvard really speaks to the love affair I have with that airplane. It's a monster, so it does feel like you're riding a dragon. There's a more there's a bit more adrenaline involved with that thing. Everything from the way it sounds. I mean, it's so loud. That takeoff power, those prop tips are literally breaking the sound barrier. It's a nine foot prop. Uh, when you hit takeoff power, you know you're behind something big, and it's it rattles and it shakes and it's loud. But then when it leaves the ground, it gets quiet and, and it doesn't shake as much. And you get the gear up, and you're still in a beast, though. You're still riding a Harley. I mean, it's 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 different. It's not the same. Like a chipmunk is just a, a the name kind of says it all, right? It's just a fun, cute little airplane that's just really beautiful to fly and fully aerobatic and all that good fun stuff. The Harvard is like, yeah, riding a dragon kind of. It's it's every time I fly it, I feel honored and and glad that I didn't screw it up. <laughs> I get back. So, and I want to show you sent me this clip. <laughs> I wish I could say that like my team of researchers found this clip from. Uh, early flight shops footage of you and, and your first ride in a T6, uh, but you you sent this to me and I, I thought it was really it really speaks to kind of the journey you're talking about about learning it. Mm -hmm. um, I just got a little a little clip here that you sent talking about that idea. The first time I was in. Let me up there, over. Yep, I got gotcha. you. All right, Steve. Perfect. This is a lot of airplane. Yeah, it's a little heavy. Great job, guys. Just great job. Welcome to Oshkosh. Have a great day today. Dude's run up and ready. All right, you were just explaining to me what that was, but I don't think they could yeah. hear you. Okay, yeah. So that that was my first time in one. I got I got the opportunity to fly with the the Aeroshell team in 2015, I think that was. And I knew what it was. I knew this is the T6. This is the thing I've been told to be afraid of, and I was afraid of it. And getting into that airplane, I remember distinctly thinking. That was the first time I got in one because when I did the ground school at that place, I was so – I did it. I did the whole – it was a full – I think it was two weekends of, of learning all the systems and everything about the airplane. And they had them in the hangar and it was kind of like a reward after that we could all go climb in. I didn't even get in because I felt like I'm never going to get to do this. And I, I was glad to learn it. felt like it was a little honor to my grandfather, but I did not even climb into the airplane. I was just sort of – what's the word? Like defeated or despondent about it. So getting this chance to fly with the Aeroshell team – it was an honor, but I also felt like getting into that cockpit, you just feel like you keep getting in. Like it's such a big, dark hole. There's just so much in there. I remember looking down and seeing all the knobs and dials and all these control levers. I'm like, what does this stuff even all do, man? This is crazy. And I just remember thinking, yeah, I said that out loud to myself. This is a lot of airplane. And then the rest of the sentence was in my head. And I will never fly one. <laughs> like, I will never be qualified. I'm just going to make my peace. I'm flying with this expert, awesome aeroshell pilot. I'm going to soak this up. But I will never be this. I will just never be able to manage this airplane. Like, good Lord, look at it, you know? So but now you are. I, yeah. So that, that I guess, it's not lost on me that I, I made that leap. Like, yeah, there I am, just getting in. You just, look at that, you just feel like you keep getting in. It's just so deep. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'm lost in there. There's just so much down there. I've never sat in a T6, but I visited EAA once, and they threw me in, I think it was the P-47. And I remember feeling just, like, not, like, like you said, you just keep getting in. Like, literally yeah. getting in for me as, like, a kind of fat, like, non uh, fit guy it was like it was like a process I was like oh like you gotta put your foot where and there's a secret door for your foot here and then yeah and so that that resonates with me it's like how do you and then to think about well, I mean, strapping it on stuff. at like 18 or still, whatever can everyone still see that like all that stuff right it just yeah. looks like what the hell it's everywhere everywhere you look there's some knob some hidden something but it's crazy yeah so I'm at a point now where muscle memory I just know where everything is um, but it's intimidating. But again, it's just, again, it's like instrument flying or anything else. You just commit to learning it, do a lot of dry time. That is what I did to get used to this airplane. I did a lot of dry time in the cockpit. So I had the muscle memory of where everything was. Cause once you're flying, it gets loud, lots going on. You can't be looking for something. Right. So let's talk. So let's go from this moment of mm -hmm. flying with them 
uh, to this next one that you sent me, uh, which I think was a this separately as a filmmaker, uh, I was really excited that you kept this moment in the video because it was so real. Uh, this is, <laughs> and uh, we'll play this and we'll talk about it. This is, uh, I think, I think your first solo. You've gone and done it. Now you got to get this airplane back on the ground by yourself. So you're, so you're, oh, this other thing's still, still playing. So you're sitting there and you're like, and I think we've all had them, like all of us that have had the privilege to get to our solo flight. I think we've all said that, <laughs> right? But we've never said that riding a dragon. Yeah, right? <laughs> I did. I I did literally have that moment of what the hell were you thinking, dude? You, like you, yeah. But that one also, I really did feel like I was with my grandfather on that flight, and I I think I even talked to him a little bit in the cockpit on that one. So there was something else going on there that was pretty cool, and I didn't I didn't expect that emotional response that happened on that flight, but it did. Um, yeah. That was that was definitely big. Uh, I would equate it to, or even say it's bigger than my first solo, just because something about that airplane represents so much. It's the gateway to all the warbirds. All the guys that I've talked to that fly Spitfires and Mustangs say, if you can fly the T6, you can fly any of them. That's why it, it was made that way. To there was a high washout rate because it was. It was the Warbird trainer. It's not forgiving. It does nothing for you. It's, it makes you work. But when you fly it well, it, it, it's a beautiful airplane. And then sometimes you get to do this. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes you get to do that. It's pretty awesome. That's pretty crazy, man. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, so there's so many so many ways we could go. I mean, I think I just want to – I just also love your dog. Uh, (laughs) almost as scruffy as i am (laughs) that's awesome uh so okay so you've got this journey i think the the, here's the question i have a couple questions then we're going to go to the chat and then hopefully we'll be able to play a little game together before we sign off um this hour is flying by uh i i want i wanted to ask you i mean obviously the goal for you is the Spitfire, we talked about at the, at the top of the hour, the intro kind of lays that out. And I've heard you in an interviews say that, like, you've rejected rides. Like, people have been like, yo, like, I'll hop in the back of my two-seat Spitfire and whatever. That's the goal. I mean, is there, is there, um, like, if we had to think about, like, flight chops, you know, I guess <clears throat> post-pandemic, right, where things, we can start creating more stuff again, right? But, like, what's what's next what's on the horizon what's the next step for you to to keep moving towards that spitfire goal well so to be clear like i don't want to sound like a jerk it's it, the, oh, the I, rejecting the rejecting rides is 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 um i don't want to ride in a spitfire i want to i want the training so i want to show up prepared i want to have the earned the right to sit in the proper seat and get the training to be signed off i don't necessarily need to solo it i just want to know that i've been signed off in my logbook qualified spitfire pilot so I didn't want to get a ride when I didn't feel like I was prepared to be trained. So that that's sure. kind of where that's coming from. Um, so I'm kind of there now, but now that the, I've got almost 50 hours, I think, in the T6 and well over 100 solo landings. So I'm qualified for most of the programs that want to see you show up with a certain amount of time in the T6. So I'm there. Um, now it's just a question of getting that opportunity lining up with not a pandemic. <laughs> I was kind of hoping to have done it this summer, to be honest. I was going to go to England and try to get that worked out, but that universe sort of conspired against that plan. Um, going forward, I mean, I'm in a kind of all over the place bot. The next plan was to get the multi IFR done in the DA42 on the G1000 so I could kind of get my glass instrument multi sorted. I've got my multi engine rating in Canada, which is VFR only. You can get that rating. I did that in a, in a Seneca like mm-hmm. you know bust old six pack panel no autopilot just nothing to help me so i felt good about that and i did my instrument rating in the similar kind of beat up old 
Piper we had a constant speed prop and no autopilot and Garmin 430 and I did have a G5 so that was super handy but essentially a six pack so going forward we're building the RV14 which is going to have a kick ass glass panel autopilot lots of automation so I want to do lots of cross country instrument stuff but it's also tailwheel and aerobatics so I can kind of play with those angles as well keep on getting better and sharing that type of flying so, I mean, going forward, yeah, it's going to be using the RV-14 to get to a lot of different places, being able to share the process of planning flights and executing longer cross countries with that technology, and then ideally flying myself to somewhere to then jump into something else that's, you know, a warbird or something else that's not high tech, and then continue creating content that way. And yeah, ultimately, is- getting the Spitfire checkout is, is definitely up there. I wouldn't even say it's the be-all and end-all. It's just a really... It's a big goal, but I don't think it's like after that I'll just break my GoPros and. You know. <laughs> it's funny you mention that because Marty in the chat, again people know Marty uh, from some of my videos. He says, "I hope Chops doesn't mic drop and quit making videos once he flies a Spitfire." Uh, he's saying the end goal, the end part has me concerned. I'm assuming that after the Spitfire, you're gonna be like, "Now <clears> I need <throat> to." Uh, I don't know why I gave you that accent. Uh, now I'm gonna like uh, gonna learn how to fly F-15s. <clears throat> Yeah, whatever. it's interesting. <laughs> that um, I think jets are really cool and everything, but I think to me, what I love the most about warbirds is I do feel like that was the sort of the point where human and machine were aligned at their maximum, if you know what I mean. Like neither the machine nor the human could outperform the other. I mean, you, know, you could knock yourself out pulling G's in a, in a fighter, I guess. But what I'm trying to say is, man and machine were like at their peak with that era, like those warbirds that, that had lots of power, lots of performance, but the, the machine couldn't do anything without the person. You know what I mean? Like, like they don't help you. You have to do it all. Whereas you get into these jets where they're like, this bag of meat is like just a liability, man. Like, get out. And that's where we're at, right? Like, jets can do so much more without the bag of meat that is going to just liquefy. <laughs> like, it can make all the decisions. It can fly itself. I mean, yeah, you can fly remotely and make decisions remotely. And there you go. You don't need to be on board. So I kind of, that's not lost on me. So the, the sure. experiences that I've had in sort of like really high performance stuff, I just feel like my 46 year old bones are just going to break. Like I'm not that great shape. I've already been almost hurt doing some competition level aerobatics with another pilot that was showing me his routine. Almost literally broke my neck. It's like, yeah, this is not fun. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like if, yeah. you're, if you're doing it yourself, that's one thing, but you do not want to ride for that type of stuff. So, no interest those... in ever experiencing that on my end. I love the back I mean, specifically. I, Maybe I, once. I, I want to get into an F eighteen, no question. But no, sorry. I, I think there's. I, there's I will thing. totally ride in any jet. Like anyone who wants to be ride jet, I will totally. I meant the Lumshavak specifically. Like, they, yeah. <laughs> no interest in that. The snap roll, dear is Thunderbirds, worse. dear Blue Angels. Yeah. Yeah, but see, even those things, it seems like that there's this rite of passage where they want to go and do a nine G turn and see if they can right. knock you out. You got to realize, you got to get like, the pin right. I haven't been there for the briefing, but I hope that they brief everyone to say, "Do not move your head or try to look to the side or do something stupid." Like we're gonna pull G's. You flex and you look straight ahead, and you do not because if you try to do that and then they pull, like you're you're gonna get hurt. You could have a life changing injury. I had it almost happen to me in in the pits S two B. It was a very sudden pull. That we briefed it. I knew it was coming, and I just, I don't know, I was off board for that moment, and I felt my whole cervical spine, all of it, crack like a, like a chiropractic adjustment in the plane. And I'm like, how did I hear that crack? And I later talked to a friend. He's like, you heard it through bone conduction. But I had another fan that's an orthopedic surgeon that said, you got to get that looked at because you could have herniated the disc. And I was in pain for months after that. Whoa. And I don't blame Luke who I was flying with. It's not his fault. It's my fault. We briefed it. But he was showing me his full-on advanced routine as a passenger. And he's just like other people said, you just you don't do that as a passenger. You don't sit there for that stuff. That's just too much. But I made it through all of it except that one millisecond where we were in a vertical dive after a spin. And I was kind of recovering from it. And I didn't flex at all. Like you see it in the video. It's hilarious. Like I just fold like my neck just crumbled like it's just like it wasn't ready for all those g's like a switch right it's like mm, instant all those g's right away so your head is like 70 pounds instantly right so yeah it's it's so the, the, the warbirds i just felt like that you're managing this machine there's so much going on and you're flying harmoniously and it's just this perfect blend of man and machine 
there's something special about that. I totally agree. There's like, uh, it feels alive with you. Yeah. You're both right there at your maximum, and you got to bring your game. Some other guesses in the chat. Uh, BVR says Chops in Space. I'm sure Virgin Galactic <laughs> will call you. Bob Smith says uh, you're going to come to the dark side of rotary wing. Now, you have flown a helicopter. I, yeah, you have done so I'm that. I'm definitely going to do it. Definitely going to do it. So I did I did one kind of hardcore lesson. And, and, again, because of the range of experience that I've been lucky to have, the instructor said, we won't get to the point where you can control it with all four controls, but we'll try. It'll be funny. But I was able to. And he was like, this doesn't happen on the first lesson. I, you can't hand a helicopter to everybody with all of the controls. But he was good at giving it to me one at a time. But I think that the thing is I have a very short um, couple or whatever you want to call it between feedback and input because I do so much stuff that I have to be mm -hmm. aware of, like, what is me and what is the machine? And I'm, I'm kind of in tune with it. So I was quickly able to tell what was going on with the helicopter. But it's, it's, it's uh, yeah, it's awesome. I'm definitely going to do that. But it's it's a whole different game. That's a whole different thing. Like every little you think it and something happens. And if you let one thing go, all the other three things have to change. And if you don't catch it, you'll be in a feedback loop that will quickly like be a you know a positive feedback loop where you'll be out of control. So it's yeah. it's really interesting. Every time I go to Oshkosh, I go by the ultralight area, and there's those guys in the little, little single seat turbine helicopters, and I'm like, I just want to fly that off my roof. Yep. Uh, we have a merch idea from Just Plain Silly for you. Says I'm gonna make a bag of meat flying shirt. There you go. I I do jet that. pilots. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Uh, so many other good questions in the chat, guys. But we're almost out of time. And before we run out of time, I got it. We got to do short final. Did you, have you seen this? Me do this before? You've been I, in the chat I, a couple times. Yeah. Yeah. S so That's we right. get, we put a minute on the clock. I ask you a bunch of stupid okay. questions. You give me a bunch of really well thought answers. And uh, the points are fake. What does Drew Carey say in uh, that? In uh... <laughs> is it supposed to be one word answers or what's the? I mean, you can you can answer however you want. I don't, I don't care. Yes. There are no there are no rules. There's no, no rules. rules here. All right, let's do it. All right, we're gonna put my funny, funnily dramatic music on here. Let's start the timer. All right, flight chops. I think I know the answer to this: tail wheel or nose wheel? Yeah, tail wheel. If you weren't flight chops, what would you be doing right now? making reality TV that I wasn't loving. Uh, if you could only fly one plane, like you had to pick one and fly that one for the rest of your life, which one? Damn it, I can't do it. It's not possible, I can't answer that. Can't do it. Fair enough. Uh, what was the favorite episode you ever made? Yeah, I can't do it either. I, I would probably say the one I'm probably most proud of is like the stuff I did with the Coast Guard, just because that was such a, an honor to share their, their thing. And, and be a part of that, but it was also really hard. Yeah, uh, I would drown. Uh, okay, favorite passenger you've ever had in your airplane? Favorite passenger? Probably my daughter. It's cool, right? Uh, favorite airport you've ever landed at? Toronto Island is pretty cool. That good memories there. At Island. And to give us a little more for people who don't know where that is, what's the CYTZ? I've got a video of flying at night there. That's like pretty raw like 45 minutes and it's 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 you're right beside the city and you're doing the approach with like giant buildings right there and it's i think it's in like lots of magazines it's like one of the top 10 coolest approaches runway 26 at the toronto island airport it's basically like it's even kind of cooler than megsfield because you're closer to the city well, I mean, it's cooler than Megsfield because it exists. Because Megsfield doesn't exist. Yeah, well, in, in my life, <laughs> Megsfield did exist in my flying career. But, yeah, it's gone now. Oh, man. Okay, dude, this has been really awesome. I really want to thank you so much for taking some time and a wait. It's late. You're in Eastern time. It's late for you. Uh, so thanks for taking the time to chat and uh, no turning that that hard maybe into a yes. Yeah. And, so and enthusiastic. No, you're no busy. Bad. You're a busy man, Steve Thorne. Got a lot of things to do. Uh, and also, uh, bummed we couldn't get together this year and make more stupid vid stupid videos together. But hopefully we'll get to make some together again sometime soon. Yep. Cool. That was, a, that was the most non-committal answer I could have gotten, and I love you for it. Uh... <laughs> All right, guys. Sorry we couldn't get to everyone's, everyone else's uh, questions. People are asking you how you stay so skinny. People are asking you... Jeans. Uh, 
I don't try. I eat like a maniac, and it doesn't. I can't change my weight. It just doesn't change at all. Whether I try, you, eat lots of protein, work out, maybe I can gain five, ten pounds tops. Don't matter. I can't. I can't. I can't. So I just, I just accept it. That's who I am. I think. I think what happens is there's like a thing in your stomach, and it sends the food through like a quantum hole into me. It's the it's the tapeworm of, of intergalactic, yeah, wormholes. <laughs> Okay. All right. All right. Thank you so much, dude. Uh, everyone else in the chat, thank you so much for being here tonight. It was awesome. Saw a lot of new names in the chat. It was great to have you. If, you've, uh, if you're have you coming in uh, from Flight Chops channel, you know, check me out. I got some stuff. I got some stuff, uh, including some stuff with Steve, which is uh, we met last year, and it was, it was really cool. So everyone, uh, stay safe. Stay healthy. Keep flying, go get current, all that jazz. And make sure to tune in next week for uh, the triumphant return of our good friend <coughs> Just Plain Silly. I have no idea what we're going to talk about, but it will probably, you probably, you might get a chuckle. All right. Anyway, <laughs> thanks, guys. Thanks to Steve. We'll see you guys. Uh, we'll see you guys next time. <laughs>